Good morning. It's the Drive to School podcast. Wake on up. I'm Pastor Goodman, and joining me today is Pastor Brian Wolfenbler. Thanks so much for joining us, Pastor. Great to be here. Great to be riding along to school, going approximately the speed limit or one mile over. Everybody's wearing their seatbelts. That's right. <laughs> so I was in a car uh, one time, by the way, that flipped over. All three of us were wearing our seatbelts, and we all ended up hanging from the roof. That was amazing. So keep those seatbelts on, kids. Glad they work. Yeah, that's a different thing. They uh, they actually talked about um, whether or not I should record this thing while uh, sitting in a car. Um, but... I, I, I don't know that my ADHD could necessarily handle it. And I would be, I would be a danger. Even if it was in park, I would be a danger just because there's that horn button. And like, I have this thing with buttons where I just want to see what they do when I push them. And so that's for the audio, I guess. The thing there's no eject <laughs> button. I, that's right. I wish there was. <laughs> All right, so we are, uh, we're asking Pastor Wolf Mueller questions and listening to him uh, teach us. So uh, the question for the day is, uh, Pastor Wolf Mueller, is it a sin to want to get married but not have children? Probably. The answer is probably. So the, here, let's, but let's talk about it a little bit more. So the Lord gives the gift of marriage in the Garden of Eden when he, oh, how fantastic is this? He looks at Adam even before the fall into sin, and he says, that's not good. And he says, and I'm going to prove to you how not good it is. So he parades all the animals before Adam and he names all of them. Adam recognizes each animal and its own unique created goodness given by God, but there's no help meet found fit for him. So the Lord puts Adam to sleep, takes his rib, crafts Eve, wakes Adam up, gives Adam and Eve to one another and institutes the gift of marriage. This is the, this most profound gift that a man should leave his father and his mother and cling to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. And you got to think that when the Lord tells that to Adam and Eve, they're going to, they're going to think, well, what's a father and a mother? <laughs> Cause they don't, who, who are they going to leave? How can they leave father and mother? They don't have father and mother to leave. They are the father and the mother, but it's, isn't it amazing that when the Lord talks to Adam and Eve, he talks to them in the context of father and mother. And that points to the, to really to the essence of marriage. Now we, we talk about three purposes that the Bible gives in marriage. Uh, it is as a, a help, both the, because we need each other, the, uh, man and woman, husband and wife, the wolves are at the door and we need the gr different gifts that the Lord gives. Uh, we need each other also to avoid sexual sin. So Paul will talk about uh, it's better to be married than to burn with lust. And so there's the need for help, companionship. Uh, there's also the enjoyment of marriage that husband and wife are supposed to find delight in one another, top to bottom. So, I mean, this is the, uh, uh, the emotional, the intellectual, the life together delight. It also includes the act of marriage. But chiefly, we have the command from the Lord to be fruitful and multiply. And that is normative for our understanding of marriage. And so uh, uh, married couples are always, according to the Lord's word, open to the Lord's gift of children. Now, what does that openness look like? And are there reasons why um, a husband and wife might not pursue uh, the gift of children? Uh, yes but those are going to be the exception. And so to desire to get the gift of marriage is to um, rejoice also if the Lord gives children. I, I, I don't say it this way, that in the biblical way of thinking, to be a husband is to be a father and to be a wife is to be a mother. The two go together. In fact, that's why we don't call it the right of what we call it, the right of holy matrimony. It's the right of holy mothering. Because now when, when man and woman are brought together in the gift of marriage, then comes the hope uh, and the possibility of children. So in general, we look, to, um, we look to marriage and the great gift of children as a blessing. And one of the problems that we have today is that there's a, just a war against children, but we should, know, we should recognize the war against babies goes all the way back to the very beginning when uh, there's something sassy when the Lord says to the devil, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and her seed, between 
uh, between you and the woman, between your seat and her seat. And the devil has to think, wait a minute, I don't have kids. I can't have kids. But the, so the devil's seed, what is the devil's seed? Is sin and death. But Eve can have children. And Eve does have children all the way down until that seed, Jesus, the baby, Jesus, is going to be the one to crush the devil. And so the devil from the very beginning has been waging a war on babies out of jealousy, out of fear, out of envy, out of, I mean, everything that's in him. So he, he tries to kill the children in Egypt. Remember the Pharaoh? He tries to kill the children in Bethlehem. He's described in the, in the book of Revelation in chapter 12 as the dragon waiting for the child to be born to devour the child. And so the devil's always fighting against babies. And we see that in our own day. When, for example, you define marriage as something that can't produce a baby, it's impossible, you know, as two men or two women. Or when you have people transitioning to being childless, taking chemicals or having surgery to prevent them from being fertile and being able to have children, it, it all comes down to the devil's war against children. And one of the ways we fight back against it is by rejoicing in the Lord's uh, gift of marriage and fatherhood and motherhood. So that's a long answer to, to the question. That's a good, and it's a good place to start with recognizing that, that there are again, wills and wants apart from our own. Uh, we talked last time about our, our wants being broken uh, by sin. And so I, I think this is another chance to evaluate simply by the fact that God calls children a blessing, a, a good mm -hmm. gift from God. And so that means that he has good uses for it. Mm -hmm. um, I, the, the common I don't know, excuses or, or concerns or whatever you want to call them are, are that uh, one, I, I hear a lot about, you know, how scary the world is and, you know, how, who could want to bring a child into this? And I've got little kids. I understand that fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other is, you know, that, that children are so expensive. And if we don't have them, we can, we can engage so much more in, in our passions and our careers and yeah make the world a better place. Um, and then I, I understand also, again, I have little kids and so I, I have less time, but also, I, I mean, some of the things that God calls blessings, they, they're outside of the things that I would call, he calls suffering a blessing. Mm -hmm. And he uses that for great good, even though my sinful desire wants nothing to do with it. Simply yep. starting with the fact that there are wills and wants that are clearly evil from the devil and clearly good from our God. It, it's a good place to start to reframe the discussion. That's right. I, I think that's right. So if I say, well, I don't want kids, but it seems like the Bible wants me to want kids. So now instead of trying to justify myself and, and make, here's the, all the reasons it, we can examine them and, and repent of them. And maybe it's selfishness. Maybe it's fear. There is an audacity. Every child born is an act of raging against the machine. <laughs> you know, here, here, the world wants us to tell us that things are so bad that bringing children to the world, what it's going to, I mean, it, it, it's going to increase uh, damage to the climate. <laughs> We're going to overpopulate the world. We're going to be impoverished by all of our children. I'll, I'll tell you when I see impoverishment uh, as a pastor, and sometimes this is just the case, sometimes people are never married. Sometimes they can't have children. But when I'm at the deathbed of a person that doesn't have any children, they're really impoverished. When I'm at the deathbed of a person and they've got seven kids, their death is like a party. It's, it's an amazing thing that at the end of life, your joy is almost, I mean, it's first of all connected to your confession of Christ and then to how big your family is. It's an amazing thing, which I, I say, look, having children is like having a good insurance policy. Uh, they're expensive when they're babies, but then you're expensive when you're old. And so they, they can help take care of that. So we're always thinking if we're, you know, we, we're, we're always thinking forward uh, as Christians. That's part of our hope, the story we tell about the future. And it might seem overwhelming when you're young. I mean, nobody ever in the history of the world says, okay, now I'm ready for kids. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> It's impossible. The Lord has arranged the office of parent in such a way that nobody is good at it. And you know that, and I know that, and everyone listening knows that because you had parents who were not good at it. I mean, maybe you had wonderful parents who tried hard, but they sinned against you. And one of the great things about, I suppose, becoming an adult is forgiving your parents for the sins they committed against you. So, 
so we recognize that no one's going to be good. No one's ready for it. No one's ever there for it. But the Lord has given this as a gift. And now we receive, we really do confess. We believe that children are a gift from the Lord. And if our experience or our desires don't match up with that promise of the Lord, then there's something to repent of and to rejoice in the Lord's forgiveness and his wisdom and his clarity, which is far beyond what we can know or understand. That's a great jumping off point because dealing with it going forward, um, the sinner in me always wants to do uh, everything to the extreme. Um, and so I'll start with just a, a raw selfish desire. I want nothing to do with kids. That sounds hard. And then once I'm convinced they're a good thing, I'll try and justify myself by them. And I'll say, so I, I clearly have to have just as many as possible. And that will make me. And what if the, the, the forgiveness and mercy were the thing that uh, put you right with God and everything else was it was a gift. They did it with the suffering too. There was the old Adam who wanted nothing to do with suffering, the Epicureanism that, that just wanted to feel good. And then uh, the early church, they wanted so badly to be martyrs that we actually had to preach sermons saying it's okay just to die of natural causes. You can still be saved. And in the same way, there, there are, um, there are so many sides of, of, of uh, childbearing inside of the church where there are people who want nothing to do with what God clearly calls good. And there are people that have leaned so far into it that it would almost feel like a justification uh, when instead it's a good gift. If you want nothing to do with something God calls a good gift, I want to talk to you, but also it's a gift. God gives it. Right. Right. That's uh, I, I heard someone, I was talked so much about suffering. Someone came and they said, pastor, my life is pretty good. Does that mean I'm not a Christian? I'm not suffering. I said, no, look, Jesus is Lord. This is not the Epicurean suffering is bad. The Stoic suffering is good. The Christian says Jesus is Lord. And if he gives good days, we rejoice. If he gets bad days, we rejoice. If he gives big families, we rejoice. If he, if he gives no families, no children, no, even no spouse, we rejoice. We rejoice in whatever the Lord doles out for us. Cause he's got us each on an individual tutoring track and he's, he's teaching us the ways of his kingdom. And we rejoice in, uh, in every day's lesson. That's fantastic. I think uh, before I equate having children with suffering too much and my wife hears it, uh, maybe we should, maybe we should start to uh, wrap things up because that's not what I mean. Um, <laughs> but you know, I mean, there is the, the reason why there is suffering connected with children is because there's such great love connected to children. And when when Mary is told, when she is taking baby Jesus to the temple and says, a sword will pierce your own heart. There's no, there's no pain like the, the suffering of children for the parents. That, that is the worst thing. So, so people are afraid of that, but in some ways you would never, this is what the, one of the things the cross teaches us is that the suffering is worth it. It's worth it to endure the cross, despising the shame for the joy set before him. And so it is that the Lord gives us mm, in the gospel, he gives us the freedom to experience this, the full depth of human suffering, uh, knowing that we don't need to avoid it because Jesus is Lord and he's with us in the midst of it. And he actually uses it to, uh, to, to bless and to serve us. It's, it's wonderful. That's magnificent. Pastor, thanks so much for uh, talking to me about car crashes and children. <laughs> <laughs> Great, Harrison. Thank you. God be praised. Yeah. Have a good one. We'll talk to you next time.